Okay, I think you can get started now, Amy. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to welcome you. I'm Amy Leister, and um, today's webinar is Business Interruption Insurance. This is the 11th webinar that we've hosted in a series of COVID-19 programming that we've been working to bring to our membership and to the community. Our topics have ranged from CARES Act to how to uh, attend and do a Zoom meeting, health and wellness in the, work, in the workplace and in work uh, remote environments. This webinar has been a collaboration with our regional chambers of commerce, NEPA Alliance and Lesson Alive. I'd like to recognize our participating chambers and they include Greater Wilkes-Barre, Greater Pittston, Greater Carbondale, Hazleton, Chamber of the Northern Poconos, Back Mountain Chamber, Wyoming County, Pike County, and Schuylkill Chambers of Commerce. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted at the end of the day to the Chamber's resource page at www.scrantonchamber.com backslash important resources. And the questions and answers will be enabled following the formal presentation. At this time, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our presenters today from Munley Law. They include Dan Munley, Marion Munley, and Melinda Gillardi. Dan Munley has been practicing law for more than 25 years. He is board certified by the National Board of Trial Advocacy in both civil and truck law. Dan has been selected to the best lawyers in America, Pennsylvania Super Lawyers, and was named Trucking Lawyers Top 10 by the National Trial Lawyers. He is an alumnus of the University of Scranton and has received a Juris Doctor from the University of Tulsa College of Law. Marianne Munley has been practicing law for more than 30 years. She is triple board certified by the National Board of Trial Advocacy in Civil Law, Civil Trial, and Truck Law. She has been named to the Best Lawyers in America list by the Best Lawyers since 2012. Marianne has also been selected to the list of Pennsylvania Super Lawyers for the last 15 years and has been consistently recognized as one of the top 50 women lawyers in Pennsylvania by Super Lawyers Magazine. She is an alumna of the University of Scranton, attended the London School of Economics and Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. She received her Juris Doctorate from, Pennsylvania, from Temple University of Law. Melinda Gillardi is, um, was worked as a Assistant Federal Public Defender for 33 years. She served as the first Assistant Public Defender from 1988 till 2017. Prior to joining the Federal Defender's Office in 1986, she was an Assistant District Attorney in Lackawanna County. She is now an Associate Attorney with Munley Law. She is an alumna of the University of Scranton and received her Juris Doctor from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Dan Munley. Dan, I think you're muted. I'm sorry about that. I was I, I'm starting off by saying thank you, Amy, for that kind introduction. And I wanted to say hello to everybody. I'm excited to be here today as our Melinda and Marion to try to educate you a little bit about a subject that some of you might not be familiar with, but may be able to help you bridge the gap during this uh, pandemic called the coronavirus. But today we're going to be talking to you a little bit about what's called business interruption insurance and we're going to go through the basics of this what it is how to find out if you have it what kind of costs and losses are covered by it and finally what options are available to you if you file a claim now we're going to be moving quickly through the material so that um we can get through it all because it's a complicated issue so we will have time for questions at the end but one of the things that I hope that you were able to secure was actually a copy of your policy. So that when we start to go through these things, you'll be able to thumb through your policy quickly to see whether or not the things that we're talking about actually appear in your policy. Like you will learn during the course of this process, this is a subject that has come up now all across America where people just like you who are experiencing business interruption of their business, interruption of their businesses are now looking to their policies to see whether or not they have this coverage. And Marion will take you through some of the statistics that you will hear about the insurance industry and the decisions that they made long ago about this particular type of coverage. 
So I think today's program will be very informative for you in learning a little bit about business interruption and hopefully enable you to bridge the gap um, during this terrible time. And also, I just want to say as an aside that um, I want to thank the chamber for allowing us to come forward and talking to you in this format, the, the Zoom format, which I find very fascinating because now I can see all of you, or I can't really see you because your cameras are off, but we get to be together even though we can't be in the same room. I do miss that. I miss the interaction with people and I'm looking forward to getting back to the way it used to be whenever that time may come. And with that, I'd like to turn the program now over to Melinda, who's gonna get us started. Melinda? Melinda, you're muted now. There we go. Good morning, everyone. I'm very honored to be here and to share with you some of the information that I have learned over the last two months about business interruption insurance. So business owners all over the United States are grappling with the same issues regarding business interruption insurance that you are as business owners. Mundley Law has been involved with business interruption insurance cases since Governor Wolf issued his stay at home order and many businesses were forced to close or to scale back their operations. We here at Mundley Law review insurance policies all the time in our personal injury practice. So it really was a natural fit for us to become involved with business interruption policies. Monthly Law is a small family run business for 60 years. So not surprisingly, we want to advocate for other small businesses. So let's get started. What is business interruption insurance? It is insurance coverage that replaces business income that is lost when you are forced to close your doors as a result of a disaster. The disasters can take many forms, a fire, a natural disaster, or a pandemic. Business interruption insurance covers the revenue you would have earned had the disaster not occurred. The policy also covers operating expenses like electricity that continue even though business activities have come to a temporary halt. Business interruption coverage lasts until the end of the business interruption period as determined by your insurance policy. Now, throughout this presentation, you're gonna hear us say a lot as determined by your insurance policy. That's why Dan suggested that you have your policy handy. So as we're going through the various aspects of business interruption insurance, you can look at your policy and determine whether or not you have that aspect of it or that coverage. Most business interruption policies define the period of in question as the date that the covered peril began until the date that the damaged property is physically repaired and returned to the same condition that existed prior to the disaster. Business interruption insurance is not generally sold as a separate policy, but it's either added to a property or casualty policy or included in a comprehensive package policy as an add-on or a rider. There are four aspects of business interruption insurance that are displayed here on the screen. The first one, is called by many different names depending on the policy. So we have here business income, but it's also referred to in some policies as income protection and business interruption. Again, you need to look at your policy to determine what terminology your insurance company uses to describe this coverage. Extra expense, civil authority, and dependent property are also other aspects of business interruption insurance. Dan is going to explain all of these concepts in further detail in a, in a few moments. 
So how do you know if you have business interruption insurance? You will need a certified copy of your policy. Based upon our recent experience, you probably will not have a copy of your complete policy. A complete policy contains the declaration page, all forms and endorsements, as well as the exclusions. Endorsements are basically additions or changes to the policy, and they are very important because they can substantially change the coverage that is indicated in the policy. And exclusions, well, that's pretty self-explanatory. Exclusions are things that are not covered by the policy. They are specifically excluded by the policy. In order to get a copy, a certified copy of your policy, you can request it from your insurance company. And as I said, you need the entire policy, including all of the endorsements and the exclusions to get the full picture of what your coverage entails. And by the way, it's been our experience that most policies can be several hundred pages. So if when you contact your insurance company, you're provided with a document that is 20 or 25 pages, my guess is that is not your complete policy. Perhaps it's the declaration page, which describes the overall coverage, but it doesn't give you everything that you need in detail. So just, just a few pointers on that. So now that I have covered some very basics of business interruption insurance, Dan is going to begin his presentation with a review of the executive orders of Governor Wolf and Secretary Dr. Levine that impact this process. Dan? Thank you, Melinda. Thank you very much. Um, so if you just go to the next slide, Melinda. So how did we get here? What happened um, officially? And we all know that the coronavirus is, is what's it's on TV, it's in the newspaper, you can't get away from it. So we all know that part of it. But how did we as a Commonwealth get to this spot? And this is how it happened. Governor Wolf on March the 19th signed an executive order that said that no person or entity shall operate a place of business in the Commonwealth that is not a life sustaining business, regardless of whether the business is open to members of the public. So even if you were a supplier of something and didn't have general public coming into your store, like most people, you were closed by the governor and he gave you two days to get ready. He signed the order on March 19th and we were all officially shut down on March 21st at 12.01 a.m. And so it was that quick. The governor is the reason why we are all closed. And restaurants, as you can see at the second, but they didn't even get that additional two days they were shut down on March 19th at eight o'clock. And so coupling that, if you go to the next slide, Melinda, please. Melinda, could you go to the next slide? Okay, is Secretary Levine, Dr. Levine's order, Secretary of Health in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, if you read Dr. Levine's order, which we have, Dr. Levine's order contains a lot more information about the um, aspects of the coronavirus and COVID-19. However, essentially for your purposes, what you would be interested in about Secretary Levine's order is listed here. And you can see that there was some conjunction between the governor and the secretary in writing their orders because it says the same thing, that no person or entity shall operate a place of business that is not life sustaining. The enforcement begins on March the 21st at 12.01 a.m. And then again about restaurants and bars for dining facilities, they were closed down on March 19th at 8 p.m. So they had two days less um, and no really no, no warning. Although we were all kind of at that time, as I recall, thinking something was coming because states were starting to shut down in different parts of the country. And we all kind of felt that it was just a matter of time until it occurred in our Commonwealth. And then these are the reasons why, the, this is the actual reasons why, or the legal reason why, you are not allowed to be open. And so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So if we go to the next slide, Melinda, please. So what are we looking for? So it's called, it's 
got a couple of different names, kind of like Santa Claus, right? So he's got uh, Santa Claus and Kris Kringle. But what you're looking for here essentially is business income coverage. And so the first way we've seen it listed in different policies that we've reviewed, and believe me, we've reviewed hundreds of policies now. It says, that you can see at the top, we will pay for the actual loss of business income you sustain due to the necessary suspension of your operations during the period of restoration. The suspend, now if you go to the next slide, Melinda, please. So essentially, that's one way we see that it's listed. A second way that we've seen business income coverage listed in different insurance policies, it's called income protection. So you want it, what I'm doing here is I want you to get your policies out to look to see if you have this type of coverage. And these are the different ways that we've seen it listed in the policies. Income, we'll go back to the first the slide for one moment, Melinda. Right, this, I didn't really get a chance to read it to them. So income protection, it says the same thing. It will, income protection means loss of income and our rental income you sustain due to a partial or total interruption of business resulting directly from loss or damage to property. Now you have lost the use of your property. And Marion will explain a little bit about that later, but the loss of the use of the property has been defined to fit that description. So if you go to the next slide now, Melinda. And this is the third way that we've seen business income coverage listed in the different policies that we've reviewed and it's called business interruption. This policy covers against loss resulting from necessary interruption of business caused by direct physical loss of, which is what we have, or damage to covered property. So those are the three ways that um, we have seen this type of coverage be actually listed in your policy. So as you're sitting in your homes or in your offices, get those policies out. And here's what they, here's the defining characteristics of them. I'll walk you through these. But you're, you're going to remember now you're looking for the, one of those three ways that it's listed. And what your requirements are going to be is you need direct physical loss of or damage to the covered property. Remember now, number one is covered by the order of Secretary Levine and uh, Governor Wolf. We have the direct physical loss of the use of our properties. Secondly, you, it has to result from a covered cause of loss, which we will, Marion will take you through a lot of those, but essentially it has to be something that's covered in the policy. And then three, causing suspension of business operations, which we definitely have. Everybody will be able to meet the elements of number three. So number two, we'll go through a little greater detail, but it's gonna be really, you're gonna need to look at your policy to determine number two. But if you just go to the next slide, Melinda, please. Extra expense coverage uh, is exp it will pay for expenses you incur during the period while you're shut down. So extra expense coverage is provided at the premises described in declarations only if the declarations show. But I'm going to tell you, if you go to the next slide, Melinda. It has to result from a direct physical loss of, which like I told you we have, or damage to a covered property resulting from a covered cause of loss, causing suspension of business operations. So let me just give you an example because I think that's the easiest way to understand. Let's say that because of the pandemic, Munley Law decided to buy laptops for every one of its employees that had you know, the camera and the microphone so that we would be able to conduct and then was allowing them to remote access into their desktops at the office so that they can continue to work from home during this process. That's an extra expense that we would not have incurred during the, if the pandemic hadn't hit, we would have the people coming into the office and using the computers at their office. But instead we had to purchase laptops for everyone um, so that they can continue to do their job during the course of the pandemic. And so that's an example of an extra expense that I want you to get your policy out if you have that type of uh, expense to see whether or not you have that coverage. Okay, Melinda, if we could go to the next slide, please. Again, civil authority coverage is just an additional type of coverage that you should look to see whether or not it's available. Now, Melinda, if you just go to the next slide, because the next slide will break down um, 
Right. Uh, this breaks down what that paragraph said. You have to have direct physical loss of or damage to someone else's property. Okay, now this time it's not you, it's someone else. Resulting from a covered cause of loss, which my sister Marion will touch on when we go through this, but you're, again, that one you really is policy driven, so you have to look in your policy. Three, the civil authority was taken responsible for dangerous physical condition caused by loss or damage to other property, and the civil authority prohibits access to covered property. So. The best example I could think of for this one um, would be, let's say there's a fire and you're in a, on a block in, a, in, in downtown Scranton and there's a fire on a, in a building in the middle of the block and the mayor or the commissioners or the governor comes in and says, nobody can go into that block because the entire block had been made unstable by the fire. Well, that's civil authority coming in and stopping you from using your business. And in this instance, um, what we're talking about here is that the governor has come in and said nobody can go into their buildings because of the dangerousness of the potential of a virus being in someone's building and spreading that virus in a community type of spread that we've heard about um, during the course of this pandemic. Well, I can tell you that everybody that I've spoken to so far, and I would ask this question of all of you, um, everybody I've spoken to, nobody has the virus on their property. I haven't talked to anybody who's, who's contacted us who said, yes, all of my employees got sick as a result of the virus. So if you're in that same type of category, then what we're talking about here is someone else's property that the governor is concerned about spreading the virus from someone else's property into the community. And so this coverage would be available to you under certain conditions. And of course, number two being the main reason we need to see your policy in order to help you read it to determine whether or not you would be able to apply for this type of coverage. Okay, so Melinda, if you just go to the next slide, please. Now, this is an interesting one as well. It's called business income from dependent properties. We will pay for the actual loss of business income you sustain due to the physical loss of or damage at the premises of a dependent property. So I guess essentially what that means is Let's say that you make, is there a second slide on that one, Melinda? I don't remember. I'm gonna just give you an example. Right, this is the definition if you go to the third right. So what dependent property means, direct physical loss of or damage to a dependent property resulting from a covered cause of loss. So let's say that you um, make widgets essentially and you need plastic in order to make them. And the plastic, you're open, the governor says you could be open, but the plastic plant was closed that you'd relied upon for making your widgets. Well, that would be direct physical loss to a, de print, to a dependent property. You can no longer get the, the supplies you need in order to make the widgets. So therefore the loss of the use of that property would be covered under your policy. So let's say you're a restaurant. Now I know restaurants aren't currently open, but if you were a restaurant and the meat packaging plant that you relied on to send you the beef and the chicken and pork to sell to your customers had an outbreak of coronavirus and was closed, that would be a dependent property that you rely on to fulfill your supply lines. And so that's the type of coverage that I want you to again, get out your policy look to see if you have it, if you find yourself in that circumstance. And then I think um, from this point, I think the next slide is uh, for Marion. And so I just, I can't express enough to you before I let go that it's policy driven and you need to get your policy out and review it. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, policy exclusions and the duty of the insurance company. But first, I just want to tell you about the insurance industry as a whole. Um, statistics from 2018 show that there were about 5,900 insurance companies operating in the United States. And there was approximately 1.22 trillion in net premiums paid. And Presently, or at that time, there were the property and casualty sector had $1.7 trillion in cash and invested assets. So 
what we have been um, reading about in this area is that the industry, the insurance industry as a whole, has made the decision to deny everyone who has business interruption insurance, um, no matter what they have in their policy. And I think one of the first cases that um, we may, you may have heard about um, was a group of restaurants, um, including the French Laundry Thomas Keller, who start filed suit um, in Louisiana asking for the court to declare that there was coverage. And speci specifically in French Laundry, since he had actually paid premiums in, in the event that there was a virus on his property, but he too was denied. So with that background, let me just tell you about what are the standards that insurance companies have to follow when they look, when a claim is presented or when they look at a claim. And um, this is not optional, this is Pennsylvania law. Um, and so what they need to do is to conduct a thorough, fair, and an objective investigation of claims. Now, we're talking about in this context, we're talking about what's called first party coverage. Um, and I know that you may have heard the terms first party coverage and the terms third party coverage and, and what, are, what are those and how do those apply. And I wanna just bring you back to that for just a second because first party coverage is the duties um, uh, and the benefits that go directly to the policy holder. So the policy is between you and the insurance company and you purchase specific benefits. Um, and at this point you've suffered losses and you can present a claim for those losses. A third party uh, claim is when someone else makes a claim against you. Um, for instance, someone makes a claim that you're responsible for an auto collision. That would be considered a third party coverage. So right now we're talking about first party coverage. The claims a policy holder has as a result of the policy. And Pennsylvania law says if a policy holder makes a claim that the insurance company has to conduct a thorough, fair, and an objective investigation of the claim. The insurance company must look for ways to find coverage and not exclude it. The insurance company must treat the insured the way they would want to be treated. And the insurance company must fully disclose coverage. And I have to say, in some of the policies and clients that we have, um, there have been um, occasion where the insurance company has not disclosed the correct coverage has told the, the insured that they were limited in coverage to a certain number when if you read the whole policy that wasn't true. So they're not allowed to do that. They have to fully disclose the insurance company. And if you make a claim, they have to make an investigation of that claim within 30 days. Okay, we go to the next policy. I mean, sorry, the next slide. Now, you have certain duties as a policy holder, and those duties you're going to find in your insurance policy. And those duties include cooperating with the investigation. Um, so you may have to um, give certain information um, about the claim. You may have to prevent pro a complete a proof of loss, and you may have to give a statement. I mean, most policies don't um, say that you have to give a recorded statement and most insurance companies um, will submit written questions. And we've noticed that um, in the beginning, um, there was just a call with the insured and then a denial. Now there are written questions coming in. So remember, there is a duty to cooperate with your insurance company. Okay. Next slide. Um, we're this is not a presentation about bad faith, but I just want to let you know that there is a bad faith statute in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania is um, basically one of a few states that has a bad faith statute. So why is that relevant? Well, some of, this, some of the cases that have been filed 
um, where the policyholder has been denied business interruption include um, a declaratory judgment that asks the court to declare that coverage is, uh, there is coverage and that the coverage covers the loss, um, breach of contract, uh, and also uh, a claim under a bad faith, Pennsylvania's bad faith statute. And the bad faith statute, I mean, not every case um, that is filed contains a bad faith claim, but um, depending on the actions of the insurance company in handling the claim, there, might, there may be reason to include a bad faith claim in the action if um, you decide to bring a claim. So what is bad faith? Well, basically the insurers the insurer did not have a reasonable basis to deny the claim or the um, insurer, the insurer knew or recklessly disregarded its lack of reasonable basis in denying the claim. Um, so those are uh, some of examples of uh, bad faith or like deliberately misleading the insured about the amount of coverage. And if we could go to the next slide. What can you recover? If a bad faith element is contained within your claim, what does the law allow? Well, you can um, receive interest equal to prime rate plus 3%, punitive damages, court costs, and attorney's fees. So certainly bad faith damages are um, something, a bad faith claim is something that the insurance company uh, does not want. Um, and it really depends on the facts of the case, but it is, a, it is a claim that is available to policyholders depending on the actions of the insur insurance company. Now we're gonna go to the next slide because we're gonna talk about the basic type of policies that we see. And as Dan and Melinda said, we've looked at um, a lot of policies uh, and what I can tell you is that most policies, most business owner policies are what's called all risk policies. So what does that mean? That means that you're insured for all risks except those risks that are specifically excluded. So again, you're, you need to have the whole policy and sometimes you know, policy holders will give us policies and they may be 30 pages, 40 pages, but we can tell that we don't have the full policy because when you look at the policy and what the list of endorsement it are, and then if comparing one to another, we can tell that we don't have the full policy. And that is what we need to look at, you know, to see if there is a claim. Um, so under an all risk policy, the the policy holder has the burden, has a minimal burden of proof. Um, basically the policy holder says it's an all risk policy and that risk is not excluded, but the burden of proving the exclusion is on the insurance company. So what do uh, we have to show? And Dan went over this earlier. We have to show, and depending on the language of your policy again, but most most policies say direct physical loss of or damage. So you can show direct physical loss of or damage. And direct physical loss of has been defined by the courts. Now I want you to keep in mind that really there isn't a lot of case law on business interruption coverage. I think in these type of issues, there's really like 1500 cases nationwide and 900 of the cases um, were decided after 9-11 when there were business interruption um, claims that were made after 9-11. So what are the cases, what are the, the uh, case analysis that we have seen and what, what does it define? Well, we look at direct physical loss of because that's what we're dealing with and that's what Dan, Dan talked about. We're not able, you're not able to use you know, your business is you're a restaurant owner and you, you're closed. Um, you have a clothing store and you're not allowed to have your business. You're not allowed to use your business. So the courts have um, talked about this in the past and found that when a structure is rendered uninhabitable or unusable, there has been a distinct loss to its owner. 
Coverage also extends where the structure is made unusable. Or if the property is uninhabitable, um, that can be uh, also a reason um, for direct physical loss of. Um, and what is the loss? Um, how is direct physical loss defined? I mean, loss is, if you look in the Webster's Dictionary, the act of losing possession. Um, a lot of terms are not defined in policies, so policies do say, um, you know, to use the common definition, and that's a common de definition of loss. If we go to the next slide. Now, there are exclusions in policies. And what exclusion, what type of exclusions are there? Well, there are policies that we reviewed that do not have virus exclusions. Um, and it really depends on your policy. This is an example of a virus exclusion. And this was um, is an ISO exclusion offered by the Insurance Services Office. And it's an endorsement to a policy. We see frequently that it's attached to a policy. Um, this came into existence after the SARS outbreak. Um, and you know, this particular exclusion, again, it's really going to depend on where it is, how it's attached to the policy. Um, not all virus exclusions are fatal to a claim, but again, it just depends. Because as Dan said, you know, I don't know of anyone that has actually virus on their property. Um, so you, the virus may be excluded, but you don't have virus on your property. You're closed because of uh, the governor's order and Secretary Levine's order. Now, if we go to the next exclusion, um, this is called the concurrent clause. And basically, um, it says, we will not pay for loss or damages caused directly or indirectly by any of the following. And this has been referred to sort of as the anaconda, anaconda language. And, you know, it's basically trying to entwine every possible cause of the loss to protect the insurance company. Um, this is something that you have to look to see if you have in your policy. I mean, this um is a a a a clause that is difficult to get around if we go to the next there are policies that have civil authority exclusions that say they won't pay um, for loss caused by order of any civil authority including seizure confiscation destruction or quarantine of a property so in other words, they're saying, well, if the government closes you down for these specific reasons or because of seizure, confiscation, quarantine, we're not going to pay. Um, not, not a lot of policies have this, but this is in some policies. We go to the next. Pollution exclusions. Um, these are frequently in policies. And I've seen a lot of denial letters uh, claiming a pollution exclusion in, in the current circumstances in the pandemic. And you know, pollution, it, it, um, I think the insurance companies are reaching when they're citing pollution exclusions. Um, pollution is usually defined in the policy itself. And you, if you can see, it's defined here. Um, and they're really reaching. We're not talking about pollution, but this is what it, some of the language the insurance company is citing to when they're sending denial letters. Okay, to the next slide. Um, the fungi or bacteria exclusion. Now, um, sometimes you'll see the fungi, bacteria, or virus exclusion, um, but in this one, it does not specifically have the word virus. And fun this exclusion is being cited in some of the denial letters, saying that your, your 
insurance policy precludes coverage because of the fungi or bacteria exclusion. Um, but if you look, other policies include virus with that. Other policies have the word virus excluded specifically. Um, so I think, again, the insurance company is reaching when they're using this to claim that you don't have the business interruption, or interruption coverage. Okay. Um, government action, governmental action. Um, this is seizure or destruction of property by order of the government authority. Um, and again, this type of action is excluded. It's, it, it's um, not something that um, I think applies in this situation, but it's something that may be relied upon by the insurance uh, company to deny coverage. And if you could go to the next slide. Um, ordinance or law exclusions. And what this basically is, it's the enforcement of or compliance with any ordinance or law. It's that the policyholder has to comply with the law. So if there's some law or regulation regarding the property that the policyholder has to apply. Um, but I have seen um, denials claiming this exclusion claiming this ex a particular exclusion as reason for why coverage is being denied. I don't think this applies at all um, to the current situation, but nonetheless, it's being used. And this is a common exclusion. It's been insurance policies for a long, long time. Okay. And I, um, you know, one of the, one of, I think what, what I've heard was there was like Wimbledon is, did purchase specific pandemic insurance and has been doing it for at least 10 years. And I believe um, Wimbledon is getting paid on their policy. I think that might be the only um, entity in the world that's getting paid on their business interruption policy. So, just to wrap up again, the importance of getting your policy, the full policy, get it, a certified copy of the policy from your insurance company. And I can't um, say that enough. And we need to see the full policy to review it. Do not rely on the insurance company's um, decision that you have been denied you need full analysis because there are things in the policy that, um, for instance, like I said earlier, you may not have any exclusions that are applicable, including you may not have a virus exclusion. So um, don't, don't rely on what they're telling you. Um, and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. So now I'm going to turn it over to Melinda Gallardi. So if anyone has any questions, please send a question to us in the chat feature of Zoom and we will consider those questions. I will read them out loud and then the three of us will attempt to answer your questions. So does anyone have any questions for us about business interruption insurance? about the endorsements or exclusions or the government orders? Well, while, while we're waiting for the question, Melinda, I thought maybe, Marion, um, you touched on this in your talk, and um, I think maybe it warrants going through one more time uh, the process that we will be following. So what would happen would be to get the coverage enforced, we would have to file a declaration uh, a, a declaration action where the court would be called upon to review the policy to determine whether or not the coverage applied. It'd be at that point that the judge would then determine whether or not the insurance company should have paid you once you made your application for the business interruption insurance. It would be then after that, that damages would have to be assessed. So Mary, maybe you just walk them through a little bit about that as well. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the first step, of course, is to get a copy of your policy, the full copy, 
and if you do have the coverage um, to make the claim. Um, the insurance company has 30 days to respond to your claim, do, and the 30 days is the law. If they do not, um, if they deny coverage, which is expected, then you have the right to bring a claim against the insurance company in court. And one of the claims that you can make in your legal action is a declaratory judgment action. And that asks the court to declare that there's coverage. You can also um, ask or, or file for breach of contract. And also depending on the circumstances of um, the way the insurance company handled your claim, you may be able to file also a bad faith claim. Um, but one of the things you do have to prove is not only um, that there's coverage, but also that you have a loss. So you have to be prepared to prove what your loss is um, right. with you know, economic proof, like forensic accountants. Um, you're gonna have to prove that. So we're gonna have to you know, look through your losses, um, your profit and loss statements, uh, that sort of thing to prove that you have a, a loss. So I have one question here about the virus exclusion. So James Solano asks, have, there have been a few cases in the court system that are attempting to override the virus exclusion on a business interruption policy. Has there been any progress on those cases and have they been successful? Marion? Um, they, they're actually, cases have just started being, filing, being filed since March. So as far as I know, there are no court decisions. I know that there was a case that was brought to the PA Supreme Court. It was on a different issue. It's called the Friends of Danny DeVito, um, who's not the actor Danny DeVito. Who's, um, he's a politician in the Philadelphia area. It's called Friends of um, Danny DeVito versus Governor Wolf. And the case was about uh, challenging the governor's authority to close down businesses. And it went up to the Supreme Court um, and the Supreme Court uh, did find that the governor had the authority to close down the businesses. And it, it does have language about the pandemic and about the danger of the pandemic and you know how quickly the virus can be um, transmitted. So there is language there from the Supreme Court about the virus. Um, but as far as any court decision on the virus exclusion following the pandemic, there has not been. So we have two questions from Michelle. And she asks, is service interruption the same as business interruption? And what's the second what's the second question? The second question is what is contingent business interruption? So is service interruption the same as business interruption? So that's where we go back, Michelle, to um, we we'd have to see your policy in order to be able to give you the first the, the answer really to both of your questions. It sounds like something that is possible, but without reading the policy and looking at the modifiers, it's, I can't tell you that answer. Mm -hmm. You Can you, Mary? No, I agree. I, it really has to see what the coverage is. I mean, how it's described um, in the policy. So we'd need the full policy to see what you have, Michelle. Right. right. I mean, it sounds promising, Michelle, but we'd have to see. So if anyone has any other questions, please type them into the chat function of Zoom and we would be very happy to answer, to try to answer them for you. Now, one of the things that, you know, is interesting is that following the um, French Laundry complaint, which was one of the first complaints that was filed, a uh, group of restaurateurs, including Wolfgang, Wolfgang Puck, Thomas Keller, and other famous chefs actually went and lobbied President Trump on the insurance issue. And if you'll recall, the president was asked about it and publicly said that 
he didn't see if if it's not an exclusion why they can't pay up and some of the lawsuits that have been filed around the country actually quote the president's um, t well, not testimony but is the president's statement um, but you know he said I would like to see the insurance companies pay if they need to pay if it's fair and they know what's fair and I know what's fair I can tell you really quickly so the the uh, restaurateurs and the chefs um, have really been speaking to um, you know government officials about uh, the coverage and you know what's happening uh, to their businesses there's also been you know on the state level on Pennsylvania state level there has been some legislation that's been proposed um, by I believe the state Senate about um, forcing the insurance companies to cover business interruption uh, losses for small businesses. I'm not sure where that is going and that has a lot of constitutional issues, um, but that is has been proposed not only in Pennsylvania, but I believe in New Jersey and Georgia and New York and other states. So sometimes you're gonna see in policies that the policy will conform to the law of the state. So that's another thing to keep in mind. I've seen that in policies as well. Marion, thank you very much. Dan, thank you very much. And we're going to turn the program back over to Amy. Well, thank you. On behalf of the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to thank Marion, Dan, and Melinda. for This is a great program and a, and a great topic that's timely. Um, for the group, I just want to let you know it is being recorded, so it will be posted later in the day to the Chamber's website. And there you go, Valerie posted it up, scrantonchamber.com backslash important resources. Uh, again, thank you to our partners. And the next slide, Val, if you can just give the address here to scrantonchamber.com. Please keep an eye out for upcoming webinars. We don't have anything planned for next week, but you'll see something soon for the first week in June. And just would like to um, wish everybody a uh, happy Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day, everyone. Stay safe. Thank okay. you.